reminded you of Elijah, Elisha, Jesus' 12 disciples. Who's with me? Amen. Moses, Joshua. Hallelujah. There must be something that you understand that you have a mantle. You have something to impart. Maybe I can write with my mantle. Something to impart. Because what I am doing is looking for strategies, amen, and looking for everything that I can find in the situation. Hallelujah. When I look at it, David was escaping to be alone. He's with a bunch of people whining. I'm sure they started talking about all their financial troubles, all their problems, texting, you know, you all day long telling you every 10 minutes how bad it's going and what's going through with you. Hallelujah. You know how some people are. They just, their problems never stop. There's too much problems just... Lots of problems. There, there are lots of problems. <laughs> so somehow, amen, hallelujah, you, you could write down in the middle of this, somewhere along the line, certain things that have happened. Who's with me? Number five, you can say decisions. Decide. Amen. I had to think about things that I was going through and thought about decisions. What, did I de what, what decisions did I make? Amen. And decisions decide. It was funny. I heard a story of Joel Osteen. I mean, not Joel Osteen, John Osteen, Joel's father. And um, he called up another minister one day. And it was a good friend of his a minister. And I heard this other minister told the story. And he said, John just called me up on the phone. And John said, while I'm standing in front of my mirror, and he was eating something, he said, I'm just finishing off something here. And he put it down. He says, and he's talking to him. He said, now I'm shaving. And he's like, wondering why he's telling me all this. Okay, hold. He says, you know that. And he said, I was looking in the mirror. And John said, and he's talking to someone on the phone. And he says, you know, I'm standing here. And he said, like, why is this guy telling me? He's just finished shaving. He's looking in the mirror and all this stuff. And it was like, and he's like, friends going, what in the world is he talking about? And he said, I was looking in the mirror and he says, well, John, somebody's got to pastor this church. It might as well be you. And he wasn't trying to be, and the friend thought, that is really strange. And then he hung up on the phone on his friend. But the friend he hung up on took that as a prophetic word. Basically like, somebody's got the lead. When you choose to make disciples or you choose to soul win or you choose to do anything, decisions decide. You have to choose. You have to make, you see some of you still say, well, Brother Warren, I'll tell you what, I'm going to start a cell group. I'm going to start five cell groups. I'm going to have churches in the home. I'm going to start something. Hallelujah. And then you'll see them five years later and They've been to about three churches at home but never led one and never made a disciple yet and still haven't got somebody to follow them. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then when you're thinking, why are they not getting anybody to follow them? Because it has to start with number one again. They got to start leading. Lead or leading. Amen. Who's with me? You've got to start taking initiative to say what I have I'm going to put it into somebody else. I have to impart something. Amen. I have something to give. <laughs> develop yourself so you can develop those around you to do the same thing. Let me say it. You've got to develop yourself. Develop yourself. Who's with me? Amen. So, so you can do what? The same thing. Develop. Isn't that right? Those around you. Amen. Develop yourself so that you can develop those around you. 
turn others into leaders. I could write down number six. Turn others into leaders. Hallelujah. Turn others into leaders. I was just writing down key things and things that I was thinking as I was going through. Because the point that came to me is one of the things that came to me is, is, is me and Kayla have made the statement before. It's called CTTM, Coach, Teach, Train, Mentor. CTTM. We were learning this when we were doing CO classes. Coach, Teach, Train, Mentor. Amen? Maybe I need to write it down, eh? What do you think? Let me write it. <laughs> C-T-T-M. Anytime you got to produce or replicate, this has to always be there. Coach, teach, train, mentor. Amen? Coach. Everyone here is called to do that. There needs to be somebody. Well, yeah, I talk to people about Jesus once in a while. Yeah, I run into that person once in a while. But is anybody you're really following through with? See, to do those things takes consistency. It doesn't just happen. You have to be consistent. Amen. Jesus had to spend three and a half years with these disciples. Three and a half years with 12 people. <laughs> three and a half years with 12 people. I mean, that was Jesus. Hallelujah. Who's with me? And we would like to happen, happen, happen in about one week. Then I thought to myself, Lord, I prayed, God, send me mature people. Send me people ready who can do it all. For some reason, I haven't found them trying to. Right now, I'm like, God, I need somebody who can write. I'm not talking to somebody who says, yeah, I can write. Write where? On paper? No, I don't need paper. I need the writing to go from to a computer to go on an e-book. Who's with me? Where it can flow. Hallelujah. Where you can write. Amen. Type. You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> you know, so does this happen? Well, yeah, I can write. That's wonderful, but we need more. Amen. Because now, then you have to find the person who can transcribe it. Then you've got to find the person who put it on a computer. Then you've got to find the person who put it in a page format. Then it's got to go from page format and have its front pages, back pages. We just went through that the last. It took us, I had to write back pages for a book because... I was trying to find somebody to write a back page for two weeks. I realized no back page is happening, so I'm going to have to figure out how to write it myself. Amen. And I made my best attempt, hallelujah, to put a back page to a book. Who's <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. You know what I'm trying to say. And it's like I can see David sitting in the cave going, distressed, debt, discontented. No, nobody's discontented. He's really out to volunteer. You know what I mean? They're already dissatisfied. You know what I'm saying? So I thought of myself, holy macro. And then I thought about Moses. He, was, he did have the message. He was the man. And he did have a major movement. He delivered the entire nation out of Israel. Wow, leadership ability. Rod of staff who's with me. Plagues from heaven. Pillar of fire cloud by day yet he goes up in the mountain and he's second in command Aaron becomes a cow builder and you're thinking to yourself holy macro all this power come on who's with me you had the message from God you were the man of God you even had a movement of great power but yet your number second in command decides to build a golden calf I thought man this is some serious help we need now because I don't even have if I had everything Moses had whoo and then he still had Aaron hallelujah come on you know what I mean Then I thought of myself, the other thing that is an st incredible strategy is, so I wrote, oh, okay, turn others into leaders. Okay, so we didn't, we tried to work with Aaron on this. That took us the golden calf way for a while. Hallelujah. You understand what I mean? 
And whether we realize or not, people are still building golden calves. There are, there are people glorifying ministers so much, they're making idolatry of preachers, and they're building golden calves instead of, you know, following. We've got to draw people to Jesus. If, if Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And so the other thing, that brings up another thing. And that is, I know this sounds real strange, but I want you to go with me to Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. And these are interesting. I know Genesis x Leviticus. Watch this. Leviticus chapter 10. And give me verse 10. Leviticus 10. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 10, verse 10. Amen. In Leviticus 10, 10, it says, and so go with me to, yeah, verse 9, one second. And what it says, well, go with me to verse 10. And so as to make a distinction between holy and profane, between unclean and clean. Holy and profane, unclean and clean. Amen. So another thing is not just turning others into leaders, but another thing is producing, who's with me, what is righteous, what is, who's with me, moral. Amen. Or we could say number seven, I'm going to put the word righteous standard. Amen. Somebody has to set a righteous standard. Hallelujah. Because if you don't set a righteous standard, somebody with me? What you will do is if that person thinks you're sloppy in grace and thinks, well, I can do anything. And so if someone thinks they're a homosexual and a Christian, they'll find somebody else who thinks it's okay to be a homosexual and a Christian. So what are we producing? We have to separate what is what? Unclean and what is clean and what is holy and what is not holy. So we must set a righteous standard. We must build in holiness. I wrote you, build, build, amen, in holiness. You know, this was something that was standard when you were a teenager, especially in my teenage years. Um, by the time you were getting, bringing people into your youth group, they were so caught up with all their secular music, all their stuff from the world. And then we used to, once in a while, I mean, almost every five, six months or something, the youth pastor would say, okay, we're going to, old things are passed away, old things are becoming, we're going to burn up everything. Bring all your things that are evil. All your wicked music, and you'd have a bonfire and burn it all up. Anybody ever heard of that? You know, yeah, mom went through that. But I can tell you what happens. One day we did one of those bonfires, and I'll never forget it. We did something like it when I even got to first year or you. They had a big thing one time where, where there were other college students had come in there, and they made a big bonfire. And I remember going to this bonfire. I was only a freshman at Old Roberts University. And there were other students that come in. They were telling them, you've got to get rid of the past because different kids were playing all kinds of secular garbage on the wings, all and they did a big push, and Richard Roberts and many people in the university at that time, the directors, the chaplain, put a, did a big push to have a big thing one day where they were going to burn up everything. And I remember that day we went to the bonfire, no joke. When they had that bonfire and that stuff started burning, I heard evil spirits crying out. I mean, you know when that fire was going up, I heard that from screams and weird stuff like, I was going, <laughs> what is going on here? This is serious demonic stuff. But to build, you have to build on holiness. So the person you're dealing with, you cannot compromise. I don't think David was sitting in the cave saying, okay, guys, it's okay, whatever you want to do, you know what I mean? You're not going to produce a mighty man of valor, a mighty man of power, if it's not done in holiness. Amen? So what do you believe? We must build, I wrote down yet, we must build in holiness. Amen? We must build in holiness. Hallelujah. Another one that I wrote down was that I thought was an incredible thing that I thought was powerful. I know these sound strange, but I'm looking for every uh, something that's replicable. Amen. Now watch this. And this was interesting that came to me. I wrote this down. I don't know why I was writing these down, but this was Genesis chapter 18. Amen. You say Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19. This is another thing. 
that you must get right. Amen. For I have chosen Abraham. Why have I chosen Abraham? Can you, do we have this in another translation at all? What are the translations do we have on this? Because, um, well, even if you give it to me in message, would be okay. Well, what was that? What is that? That's fine. For I have chosen, acknowledged him as my own, so that he may teach and command his children, the sons of his house, after him, to keep the way of the Lord, to do what is just and righteous, so that the Lord may bring Abraham what he has promised. Now I want you to notice what is his promise comes at the end. Give me another translation. Give me another translation. Oh, message. What does message say? Anything. If I have chosen him, just pick me. Let me see. I go, shall keep back from Abraham what I'm about to. Abraham going to be a lot of them. Yet, hmm, I don't know. I can't see where that is. I don't know. Okay, go to another translation. Amen. Um, give me NASB or whatever it is. Okay. For I have known him in order that he may command his children. When I looked this up in Hebrew, it was saying, God said, I know him because what he'll do is he can command his children. It says, since Abraham will surely become great, amen, and a mighty nation, and, and the nations of the earth will be blessed. But he says, for I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is righteous and justice, amen, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he had what? promised that he may bring to him these blessings i know that i'm going to give you a strategy <laughs> let me write this down number eight amen now you say why is this important because this is going to cover a broad perspective if i had to go to the scripture and say these are the qualifications for a deacon these are qualifications for an elder who's with me second timothy and go through all that well how could i summarize it if I had to summarize all those qualifications of what it means to be who's with me a deacon, I, he knew how to what? Command his children after God. Amen. Who's with me? To, to bring someone into leadership, to bring someone into leadership, we must know that they have command over their children. You say, why is that important? Because... It's pretty difficult to disciple a whole lot of other people if you can't disciple your own children. Some pastor called me today. I was talking to Pastor Ross. He, he was excited. I was talking to him, and he, he said, I knew Calvin would do this. He said, I've been, I, he had been and looked at what Calvin was doing. And he says, I'm doing some things right now. Can you, can you give Calvin my number? I'd love for him to come down to my church and do some stuff for several days. And then he was... And, and so, and he says, I knew, I knew he would be on fire. He, I knew he'd be on fire. He said, I watched how you were training him, you know. And, and so what happens is that pastor was excited now to have Calvin. There are pastors asking to have Calvin because, they, and their response to me is because we watched. We saw how you trained him. We knew you would train him. We knew he would get on fire. Amen. So this is an important thing. I'm sure David, who's with me. Hallelujah. Had, you know, with David's situation, <laughs> that was not good. That was not good down the road. Who's with me? I know these sounds like, but, but he knew how to command his children after God. So that's why the blessings came to Abraham. That's why the blessings came. Amen. So we're saying, how? So somebody has to lead. Who's going to decide what is right and what's wrong? So I wrote down under there, well, read your Bible, pray every day. If you want to grow, grow, grow. Amen. And to gather, and it says, he, then I went back and I was thinking. I kept looking at the verse, 1 Samuel 22. So David departed from there and came and, and I looked over, and everyone who was distressed, in debt, and discontented gathered to him. And I wrote, gathered? To gather, you have to be humble and submit. Try to get 400 people in a cave. If they're fighting in debt, distressed, and discontent, and discontented, like I told you, that word means dissatisfied with anything. Any, doesn't matter what it is. Nothing's good enough, basically. And if you instruct them, they already know. Hallelujah. Discontented means if I tell you, remember, I, I already know that stuff. <laughs> I had someone do the other day. I was trying to tell them something. Oh, I already know all that. And so you know what I did? I then went and picked that verse of the Bible. Paul says, I will remind you again and again, even though you think you know it. 
I'm going to tell you it about it. It, it again, Paul says. So I sent them that person, that verse back on Facebook. I sent them back. Like, we know what your problem is. Your problem is you're discontented. So when someone's discontented, you're going to have to say it to them about 50 times over. You might have to repeat it till. I told you to read your Bible. Did you read? Uh, no, I know my Bible already. Did you read your Bible? Oh, no, I, I read my Bible. I read my Bible. It's very easy to teach the Word. Any, anybody can teach. Anybody can disciple. I, just, I, t I told Daniel this morning, I said you could pick any book in the Bible. If you have to look up anything you want, just run it in its order. If you have to, just read two chapters and just start explaining it. Amen? Hallelujah. Anybody can do it. I said, I don't think anybody, anybody can disciple. Amen? <laughs> they gathered themselves <laughs> together. And I thought about it because I thought, you know, they were saying one of the recent stats that just came out like just the other day was that tithing in the beginning of 2013, end of 2013, across the entire body of Christ, the average pastor recorded out of all these people, if he had a church 2,000, he estimated only about 8.5% of people were tithing in the beginning of 2014. They did a stat on Barna now, came out in January, and basically said now the average church, only about 2.5% are tithing in a church. And I thought to myself, you see how the system is? And then they said back in 2010, it was about... 16, 17%. So you can see in a, almost every year over the last few years, tithing has almost dropped in half, dropped in half, dropped in half. Amen. And I thought to myself, what's happening to people? Amen. And so there is important things to gather. What's going on? Somebody has to be, stuff's being sowed. You know that it's not good. You know that these things are not building. Nothing's building out of that. So let me just... You've know, you got to get this, really. Let me just say it again. Number one, you've got to lead. You've got to lead. Amen? Number two, they've got to gather to a man, to a man of God. Jesus was saying, what I mean by a man, you've got to gather to a man. It's not gathering to a church. It's not gathering to a social family. That's not going to make you grow. They gathered to a man. They gathered to David who was running. He wasn't together. He was hiding in a cave. He was probably moaning and grumbling, complaining, was going through his own problems, but they gathered to a man. They didn't gather to, didn't matter where, where it was, they were in a cave and they gathered. Hallelujah. Who's with me? The second thing is they gathered to a man. He became their captain. Amen. The mantle of a captain. You say, why? Why is the mantle of a captain important? Because there must be something to impart. You have to have something that you can give. I have something. What do you have? Who are you? Amen. What can you give? <laughs> Amen. You've got to think about some of these questions. You say, what? I'm, I'm sure these guys are gathered in debt, distressed, discontent. And then by the time we get to 2 Samuel 23, they're mighty men of God who can fight the entire army just to go get David a cup of water. And by the time he got the water, he was like, oh. This water is too valuable. I can't even drink it. And he dumped it on the ground, and they never got mad about it. Where was the discontent now? He took that water and says, it's too holy. You fought. They had to kill a bunch of people, fight their way to the well, fight their way back. You know, they fought an army to the well. They had to fight their way out of the well. And how many hundreds of people they had to kill to get a cup of water, and David dumps it on the ground? And I thought to myself, they went to, I thought they were in debt, distressed, and discontented. And in my mind, I kept thinking, how do you get people to go from 1 Samuel 22 to 2 Samuel 23? God, there's got, to be a, there's got to be something you can see yet. And then I thought, decisions decide. Somehow in that cave, he had to come to himself and decide, this is what I've got to do. This is what you have to do. I'm sure you had to start appointing people. I thought that because it took me all the way back to the beginning of that verse I mentioned. And we, we're going to go into Acts, for, you know, because we're trying to deal with, deal with just how to make something happen, how to make something grow, how to get something to. And in, in the beginning of Acts, when they first get there, it says, in Acts 1, and it says, 
until the day when he was taken up to heaven, verse 2, and after he, the Holy Spirit had given orders to his apostles whom he had chosen. Whom he had what? Chosen. Whom he had what? Chosen. Then we know in, in Ephesians that God has appointed these in the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for what? For the work of the ministry, for the equipping of the saints. Amen. Amen. For what? For the equipping of the saints. So there has to come a point that you decide, I'm going to equip somebody. Amen. Maybe I need to put the word on there. Amen. I am going to equip, who's with me? Somebody. Amen. Amen. I'm going to equip somebody. There's somebody you have to equip. Amen. The other thing is we wrote down, number six, turn others into leaders. Develop yourself so you can develop those around you. It's pretty hard for me to develop people around me if I cannot develop myself. That's why the Bible says study to show yourself approved. This morning I did a message on Sprecher called The Force. I was talking about the force of wisdom. Wisdom as a force. And I was explaining that wisdom is grace applied, grace put into action. Uh, it's, not, it's one thing me having knowledge, but when I have wisdom, amen, wisdom is me letting the Holy Spirit take knowledge and apply it. And when I let the Holy Spirit take knowledge, what I know about the Word of God, what I have studied, who's with me, what I have meditated on it, and I allow the Holy Spirit to take that spirit of wisdom, because that makes wisdom become a force. And apply it. Who's with me? Then it can begin to produce change. Amen. So wisdom is really grace put into action. Amen. And so once you know how to put grace into action, well, then we see genuine wisdom. Amen. And so these are important blocks when we just say decisions decide. Righteous standard. We must build in holiness. When you are worth them, whoever you're training, you must say, I'm holy. You need to stop sinning. You need to be holy because God is holy. You need to get rid of that alcohol. You need to get rid of that cigarettes. You need to find a way to help them get delivered. Because if you don't set a standard, who's with me? You're going to drag that problem along with you all the time. You must find a way to set a standard, a righteous standard. Amen. The other thing is the reason God blessed Amos is because he commanded his children after him. Amen. He commanded his children after him. And then God said that's why he blessed Abraham. When you look this up in Hebrew, it's so powerful. And the Jewish, when I go through the, the Hebrew, it literally says the reason God's blessings came on Abraham is because God knew he would command his children. Amen. So the first thing we got to do is we got to disciple our children. Amen. You've got to disciple your children. You've got to disciple. Start with your children. Then go out. It's like Judea, Jerusalem, the uttermost parts of the earth. You've got to get your children on fire. I mean, Robert Slidham was an extreme case. People say, well, I don't like that method. But Robert Slidham, <laughs> when, when we came to ORU at 18 and he locked himself up in the prayer tower for 40 days praying and fasting. Amen. Went out of that. I watched him at Ed Dufresne's church, lifted up his hand, and people were flying under the power of God 30, 40 feet from the stage. He just pointed at them, and the power of God was throwing people through the air at 18 years old. But his mother, when he was five, six years old, made him pray in tongues for three, four hours. Sometimes she'd make him pray in tongues for three hours straight at a time, would make him pray in tongues. And when he didn't, she would whip his rear end. Well, you say, did it produce? Now he's built five Bible schools for Colin Dye in London, set up Bible school of the world, books of the world. He wrote God's Generals. He wrote three whole volumes on Smith Wigglesworth, Mary Woodworth, Ed, all these things. Stuff doesn't just happen. <laughs> well, I don't know if I can be that strong. Well, it depends on what you want to produce. Amen. That seems like too much. Yeah, but this is the strength. I don't think that David sat in the cave and said, well, all you guys just do whatever you want to do, you know. I figure you can lead yourself. No, not when you're in debt, distressed, and discontented. Hallelujah. And so sometimes I'll just get sharp with the discontented person. And I'll just come back, just give them the word. What can you do with someone like that? You've got to lead them. You've got to develop yourself. Amen. 
Develop yourself who's with me. Amen. So you can develop those around you. Amen. And we talked about coach, teach, train, mentor. Amen. We just call it CTTM, coach, teach, train, mentor. Coach, teach, train, mentor. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. Hallelujah. I, it's, you know, it's the same thing. I encourage you, son, you got, to listen, you got to start listening to my messages, son. You got to listen to my messages. I really, really, you got to listen to my messages. So I encouraged him one day. He said, Dad, what do you think I should listen to when he was coming to Maine? I said, grab everything you got on the anointing. Listen to it. So he listened to it. Turn up. By the time he got to Maine, my goodness, by the time he stepped in, I mean, bodies, I mean, the power of God hit that church so hard. But he listened to my instruction. When he did, it produced results. Hallelujah. It produced results. So he said, he said why is this important? Well, because it is important. It's important for us to move. We, I don't, we don't, I think everyone in this place is, you never can, you, you can't look at someone and say, this is all you can do. No. I remember when I was in Cornerstone, we had this guy, that guy Gary, we preached for up in Humboldt. I remember I would look at him in a certain way and I think, well, I don't know if this guy could really do anything. It was just the way he was in the church and everything. The next minute, you know, he's pastoring. And I'm going, oh, I never ever saw that coming. Who's with me? The people who you thought were the ones that were sometimes just the one you didn't even think had anything in the church ended up becoming something powerful. Who's with me? It was like God literally took the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Amen? It doesn't take something that you have to initially be flamboyant. When I look at Enoch Ataboya, the head of redeemed and sat at his congress in December. Watch three million people in one meeting one night, and sometimes they get up to seven million. Seven million people. And watch the man stand, get on his knees, as humble as can be, sweet as can be, get on his knees before he preaches, literally sit on his knee for five minutes, get up, and when he speaks, he goes, I want to talk to you today about how your prayers are 100% guaranteed, 100% guaranteed answered prayers or something simple like that. Then you go, point number one. And he tell you the verse. And they might put it up on screen and put point number one. And you go real slow. And point number two. And tell you point number two. Give you a couple of verses, maybe tell a little story or something with it. Point number three. I mean, just soft, sweet as can be, yet he has 300 and some thousand churches underneath him. The second biggest denomination in the world, and he's the most quietest, sweetest, gentle, slow speaker who says points every time he preaches. So it tells me it's not your personality. It's not how great you can scream. <laughs> it's none of that. <laughs> it's the fact that when I finished hearing his message, I was able to take it and I could go preach his entire sermon point by point and not miss one verse, one point. I could replicate it. I could duplicate it. And I could duplicate his authority because every time he speaks, he just decrees. When you're in front of three million people, it's not like you're going to run around and pray and lay hands on people. He just says, I feel like there's 369 ladies. You've got some problem on the one side of your body, and it's got to do with, and he'll name the exact specifics. Now, all those ladies stand up. You'll be healed now. They stand up. By the time it's over, they get testimonies by the hundreds. They're all healed because he just said you're healed. And if he said you're healed, you're healed. And so it's pure authority. Amen. It's not something complicated. This is something that needs to be real. So I just gave you some points. just simple points. But the point is what we want is for us to touch the region, touch the city, touch the world. You, you know, one thing that, that made Robert Sleardon's church grow when he was in California, Orange County, Kayla can tell you from almost nothing to when we got there, there was hundreds praying in tongues in the morning. It was like 1,500 in the church in a matter of like a couple of years. Is that he said everyone in church, after they had been there, 
He told them, you can, he even had a special membership class. He had people come to church every morning. It was like, what, 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, 7 in the morning before we got there, like 7, 8, hey, before their work hours started. And literally there were several hundred people praying in tongues for almost an hour and a half every morning, every day we were there. So we know that the base was tongues. We know that the apostolic power base was tongues. And I'll talk about that again because I've dealt with that before. But tongues is the apostolic power base. It's the base of power. Amen. You've got to pray in tongues every day. You know, I remember Kenneth Hagin telling a story one time. He said, I was praying in the tongues and the devil said to me, started talking to him, remember? And he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If you keep talking to me, devil, I'm going to pray in tongues for another hour. And the devil starts saying, yeah, yeah, you know, ain't nothing going to happen, blah, 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 blah. He said, okay, go ahead. I'm, now I'm going to pray in tongues for three hours. And Kenneth Hagin was telling how this story was that the devil was trying to keep him from praying in tongues. And so then the next minute, you know, he went in four hours, five hours. By the time he hit the six hours, he said he suddenly had a gusher. And the next minute, you know, after six hours, he couldn't even talk in tongues. He just started prophesying. English pouring out of him in prophetic words, just prophesying out of him of things that God was showing him. God began to speak to him and said, now. He said, I will take you through the healing revivals. He said, he, was, he began to speak to him about the healing revivals coming. And when all these different healing revivals began to happen with, a, with Jack Coe, A. Allen, all those different people in the healing revivals. And God says, and I will take you, you will not only be in it, but you will keep going beyond it and I'll take you even further. And you just keep sticking to preaching faith like I told you. And well, he went. Who came out of the healing revivals? It was all over. Hundreds of those evangelists all dead. All Roberts made it because he built a university on praying in tongues. He would always say, you are walking on the interpretation of tongues. <laughs> he was, had thousands of acres, just walked the acres for hours praying in tongues. And the next thing you know, he'd get the interpretation of tongues. He says, Raise, build me a university. Raise. Then he said when he was getting ready to build the buildings, he'd walk in tongues again. And God would tell him how to build the buildings. And the engineers would come and say, nobody can do it like that. He said, well, that's what God told me to do, and that's how you're going to build them. When they built the prayer tower, they thought that was crazy. He said, this is how you're going to build it, because this is what God said. There'll be a flame on the top. It'll go out to show how we're reaching into the world. All those things came by tongues and interpretation of tongues. Amen. Same thing when Kenneth Hagin said he prayed in tongues for six hours straight and then started prophesying. God showed him the healing revival, showed him beyond that, showed him his ministry, showed him the Bible school, showed him what he'd do in the future, showed him what would happen to the word of what, how, word, how the word of faith would grow. And all that happened from him speaking in tongues. <laughs> you know? And not many people came out of that to build like that. Two main people was all Roberts and Kenneth Hagin. Amen? And those are the two main people that influenced Kenneth Copeland even. So you don't just have the basis of the strength. You've got to look at the principles. Amen? You've got to think about these things. They gathered them. They gathered to you know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, people come to a place. I, I, I don't know how many people I remember coming, people who have even come here. Well, I didn't like that usher. I didn't like that lady the way she treated me. I didn't like the way this person did this. Well, then they're not supposed to, they're not called to gather or something. Because they're trying to gather to something. Amen. Hallelujah. But people have got, you have got to, these, these are important things, whether we realize it or not. If you're sitting in a cave, what do you do in a cave? I was sitting there going. And the thing came to me, how would you build a church in a cave? <laughs> how would you build a church in a cave with people in debt, distressed, and discontented? And I thought to myself, my God, how did he get from 1 Samuel 23 to 2 second, to second Samuel, mighty men? I said, God, you've got to give me these strategies. You've got to give me something. Hallelujah. There's got to be some kind of way to build you. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So these are, this is so important. Amen. Don't be keep like something. Oh, well, I'm not going to tell you. Read your Bible every day if you want to grow. Amen. And you've got to do it. Hallelujah. Who's with me?